In this video, we're going to talk about phonological rules on syllables. We just spent two videos going over the sonority hierarchy and syllable structure, so now we can use that knowledge and we can talk about phonological processes that specifically target syllables. So rules can change sounds in certain positions of a syllable, which means that depending if a sound is in the onset or a coda of a syllable, we can have allophonic variation in those positions. In fact, there are some rules with syllables where maybe we require something in the onset of a syllable, so we insert a sound in there. Or maybe we cannot have anything in coda syllables, or sorry, in coda positions of syllables, so we delete any coda consonants. So we can have rules like that. Therefore, having the understanding of what a syllable is, its inner components, as well as you know, phonological features in general, can be very helpful in order to actually explain some phonological processes. So the first one I want to talk about is something very common, which is English plosive aspiration. And I have six words here, and I want to contrast the first two pair, the word top and stop. Notice in the word top, the t has a puff of air coming out of your mouth when you say it, top. But in a word stop, you no longer have that puff of air. What about a word like khaki? Well, khaki is interesting because khaki has an aspirated K and an unaspirated K. K, khaki, khaki. This other G is more like a G. It kind of sounds like a G almost. Now compare that with the word cake. Again, same thing except this K is at the end of the word and it is also unaspirated. Cake. In fact, it some cases it might even be pre-glottalized. Finally, in the word pill, compared to the word spill, again, we can hear that puff of air in pill, but no puff of air on the P in spill. So the other important thing, if you may have missed a previous video, this marker right here says that that syllable coming up has primary stress. So in the word khaki, the syllable ka has primary stress, while ki does not. In uh, in spill, of course, is one syllable, so it has primary stress. So what's really the rule going on here? Well, what's happening in terms of, you know, in English words when I explain this process, is that when you have a voiceless consonant at the beginning of a syllable with primary stress, you will get aspiration. It's like a word like top. This is a one-syllable word. T is at the beginning of the word, so it is aspirated. Well, in stop, although T is in the onset of a stressed syllable, it is not aspirated because it is not the first sound. So kind of the rule to generalize this with syllables is to say that these voiceless consonants get the spread glottis feature, which means they aspirate. And this occurs in the environment where it's at the beginning of a syllable so this is the beginning of a syllable, and the syllable has stress. Uh, this is one way to write it. Another common way to write it would be to put a bracket here with a little syllable sign here, and then you could write plus stress beside it. So this rule says in the environment where this voiceless consonant is at the beginning of a syllable, it gets the plus spread glottis feature. And the plus stress is very important. If there's no stress, there is no uh, aspiration. So that's one very common rule in English that has to do with the position of a sound in a syllable. And of course, the syllable notion is important to make sure that we don't have a case like stop. And then the stress is important to differentiate it from a word like khaki, where again, this k is at the beginning of a syllable, but it's not a stressed syllable. Another process that I alluded to in the previous video is Spanish a appendices. So I have two words, and they're pretty similar in English and Spanish, but there is a very crucial difference. In English, we can say something like ski, while in Spanish, they would say a ski. In English, we say special, while in Spanish, they would say especial. And in order to really talk about why this occurs, we have to talk about Spanish phonotactics. 
And Spanish phonotactics is a little bit different from English phonotactics in that they cannot have SC clusters in onsets. So they can't have SK in an onset, they can't have SP in, a con in an onset, they cannot have ST in an onset. This is not acceptable in Spanish. So, here are essentially Spanish words, and these are the Spanish pronunciations. I haven't put the A in there yet because I want to show how the A is formed using the syllable structure before I write a formal rule out. So we're going to make syllables the same way we did for English. We're going to put a nucleus above every single vowel, a spacial, and then this will project up to the syllable. Then we're going to do the maximum onset principle. In fact, I really should do these words uh, word by word. So let's focus on ski first. Okay. So Spanish would say, okay, you can have a k at the beginning of a syllable in an onset. That's good. But we just learned in English, or sorry, in Spanish phonotactics, that we can't have sk clusters. So really there's two things, two logical things that we could do. The first thing what we could do is we could say, okay, if we have this stray sound here, we can just delete it, and we'd be left with key. But Spanish says, no, I don't want to do that. Instead, what we'll do is we want to put this as in some syllable. So we want it to go to some syllable, but we don't have anything there. So what do they do? Well, they build a new vowel to host that syllable. They build a vowel so that way we can stick that S in the coda. And this is called a apenthesis. So instead of just saying key and dropping the s, we're putting ski in the same syllable. They add a new nucleus, a, to host that s in its coda, and we get a word like a ski. Now let's do a spacial. Well, in a spacial, uh, we can put a p in the onset, we can put the s in the onset, and then the l at the end becomes a coda, but we run into the same problem. We have this s here that wants to go in some syllable, but we don't have anything to host the syllable. We need a nucleus for it. So we add in the nucleus and we have a word like a spacial. And the question really is, well, how do we know that the base form is just spacial and that a is actually being apenthesized? Well, Spanish is a wonderful language where when they make sentences, they essentially merge words together in syllables. So word boundaries do not coincide with syllable boundaries. In other words, if I end another word with an L here, and let's say there's some other word here, it is going to fit into the onset of the next syllable. So, uh, what this means essentially is that if we have another word that ends in a nucleus, then we don't need this epenthesis. We can just attach the s directly to the previous syllable that ends in an a or something. So this kind of evidence we can use to show that this a is actually being epenthesized. In fact, um, another really common way to check is let's say we give a native Spanish speaker who's learning English a word and we tell them can you pronounce the word scrumptious scrumptious like oh that cake was scrumptious and they can hear us say scrumptious and if they're just starting to learn English and they repeat back the word scrumptious to you they will say a scrumptious a scrumptious they will insert that just because they're still following the rules of Spanish phonotactics. So even though we've said scrumptious, they've heard scrumptious, when they produce it, they will still produce a scrumptious just because these are the rules that they've been following in their language for so long subconsciously. Okay, so minor detour there, but pretty interesting stuff. So here's another rule. Well, I guess here would be the formal rule for the Spanish epenthesis. We say that with nothing, we add something when it's at the beginning of the word and it's followed by an S and another consonant. So we could think of this as at the beginning of the word when there is an SC cluster afterwards. 
And like I said before, this rule is important because when we have uh, a bunch of words side by side, if we have a vowel that occurs right before it, this appendicis does not occur. So this rule says, okay, insert an A when at the beginning of the word we have an SC cluster. Okay. So there's one more thing I want to talk about. I don't have a rule for this, but this is called stray erasure. And this is to delete stray consonants. So I have a word here, a scope tuda. You can probably guess this is the word sculpture. And I'd like to build this quick. And I already have a appendices going on in Spanish. So uh, we'll just build syllables as we have. I'm not going to write N for all the nuclei, but we have a general idea of what should be happening so far. So if we put here and here, then we have onsets built. Now what we do is we want to fill codas up. And we have this ol and this p. So of course the first thing is like, okay, can we stick this p in the onset? And can you have a p and a t at the beginning of an onset? Uh, I don't think in any language you can have a p and a t in an onset. Because you can't say ptura, ptura. Uh, you kind of get that vowel in between. So first thing we can do is we can stick this l in the coda. And then we can ask ourselves, is ol p okay to be in the coda? And in English it is. Like we can say a word like scalp. That's fine. Spanish, mm -mm, it's not okay. We can't have something like culp. It's not okay. We can have cool, but not culp. So we have this problem here because we have this p, but it can't go in the coda of the previous syllable. It can't go in the onset of the next syllable. So this stray erasure rule just says, okay, get rid of it. So instead of saying a sculptura, they just say a sculptura. So they don't even pronounce the P. The P has been deleted from the surface representation. And this rule is only made possible because of syllable structure. If we didn't have some sort of syllable structure to abide by, then how would we ever classify this? Would we say, oh, P is deleted between L, P, and T? Maybe, but is that rule completely motivated? Is there something general about L, P, and T that we can talk about that makes P delete itself? Eh, not really, but with the syllable structure, we can finally target it. And uh, the rule for this uh, isn't really too fancy. In fact, it uses some new notation. So essentially, uh, we say C bar goes to null. And what this bar means is that it's just not in a syllable. So it's not in the coda. It's not in an onset. It's just stray. So this rule wasn't too exciting. That's why we don't have a full page on it. Uh, okay, so those were some phonological processes that are targeted at syllables. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them.